We're back for season six of my podcast. I'm all about putting the human factor back into business by helping organisations become places where people are happy, well and able to perform at their best. And that's what my guests shed light on with their expertise and experience. As those who know me will be very familiar with, my mantra is simple, get people right, get business right. And that means we'll be covering a whole range of topics that impact on employee experience engagement and mental well-being and many of you will know that I hate tick boxes so we'll be kicking those out getting beneath the surface of shiny new initiatives stripping back layers of complexity and going back to the fundamentals of good business that's the people this series runs alongside the launch of leadership labs and manager labs that I'm excited to be facilitating with the fabulous Gemma Ellison of Heart Leadership these are interactive and dynamic communities that turn typical L&D on its head if you you are a manager or leader and want an opportunity to problem solve, challenge the status quo, experiment and evaluate all within a small supportive group, get in touch. More information and contact details are in the podcast notes. I'm your host, Lisa, psychologist, psychotherapist and founder of It's Time for Change. Thank you for joining me on Beyond the Water Cooler. So the sun is shining and it's um, feeling quite tropical outside. And I'm sitting opposite Seb Randall. He's got the biggest smile on his face. Um, <laughs> Seb, for those of you who don't know, is a people-focused consultant and coach and founder of um, The Helpful Space. So thank you for joining me today, Seb. And I have to say I'm very grateful because I know you've had a very big weekend. So I wasn't sure how with it. You'd be this morning, but you're smiling and looking very radiant. <laughs> Thanks so much. I don't think I've ever been called radiant before, but yeah, I feel okay. I've had a big birthday weekend, but really happy to be speaking to you today. Fab. So you're um, joining us to talk about allyship, which is a really interesting um, topic to talk about. And it's something that just emerged from one of the conversations you and I were having a while ago when we were doing a walk and talk through the fields, I think also in the sunshine. Um mm-hmm. What I think would be really interesting is just to dive in with what we actually mean by allyship, because it's a term that's banded around a bit, but there's are a few people around, no doubt, who are, who are kind of curious about what that actually means. Mm. I think for me, allyship is just about putting your feet in the shoes of somebody else who is maybe from a different background to you or has a different lived experience to you. So, you know, I I don't think we should complicate it. I think it's just about, it's about walking in the shoes of another person. And, you know, it's, it's about showing empathy for somebody who maybe doesn't have the same privilege that you have and trying to find a way to elevate them so that you both have that, that sort of equity and that you're both on a level footing. That's a really good way of describing it, actually. That's probably one of the best ways I've heard of it been explained. Um, So before we get into why you're interested in that specifically, tell Mm. us a bit more about your journey in terms of how you got into coaching, because that's not always been your background, has it? No, it's not. And it's, yeah, it's been a bit of a journey to get to the allyship thing. So there's a bit of background. So Uh, I actually began my career in 99, so I'm just realising from this conversation that I've had almost 25 years in business, which is crazy. Um, And I started my career, it was actually a funny story, which I'll tell you. So I had two housemates at the time, we'd just finished university, and my housemate went for a job at this amazing company, and he came back and he said, unfortunately, they've said outright, I've not got the job. But the company was really impressive. He said they were so lively, lots of young people racing around. Um, They're still looking for someone. You might want to consider it. It's an advertising agency. And so I applied uh, and I actually sent my CV on acetate with my face behind it. (laughs) see, See me shining through my credentials. And they said, oh, we need to get this guy in. And I got the job. I love it. So, um, and I didn't really know too much about what an advertising agency was at that point, but essentially clients would bring their advertising budgets to us and we would strategize about where they should be spending their money in order to reach whatever audience they wanted to reach. Um, And I sat in this broadcast team. So I was called a a planner buyer, essentially. 
and it it teaches you a hell of a lot um because you're working with people lots of different types of people there's lots of pressure and deadlines strategy coming up with arguments for things negotiation all of those different things so it was a really brilliant learning curve for me and it really chimed with who I consider myself to be as a person love people love communicating love getting the best out of others so that was great and I did that for five years or so and then I jumped over onto the media owner side so that's where I worked for a couple of publishers um, culminating in me working for the stylist group who you may have heard of so that incorporated stylist magazine uh, which is quite a feminist title. And that's where sort of my first awareness really came in about, you know, the challenges that women women face. And, you know, it kind of married the power of feminism with kind of the joy of fashion. That's what the magazine was kind of all about, really. So, and then unfortunately in 2019, uh, there was a redundancy for about 60 of us across the business because they closed the mail publication. And at that point, I'd been in business for sort of 20 years in, in the industry for 20 years. And I just kind of thought, this is a bit of a, this is a moment for me. I just want to do things ever so slightly differently. And I wanted to start learning a little bit more again. And I wanted to focus on where my sort of key skills were, which I think is in relating to people and understanding people with different challenges and nurturing others. And so I started um, studying to be a coach. Um, and as I was doing my diploma, I was talking about it on LinkedIn and the MD of Social Chain at the time, a lady called Katie Leeson. Social Chain is the business that Stephen Bartlett founded, if anybody who's listening watches Dragon's Den. Um, and it was the pandemic. And she said, Seb, we love the idea of someone who comes from our world, who has this coaching specialism, to maybe come in and offer that extra layer of support to people. Um, and that was just such an amazing opportunity for me. I mean, they are such a well-renowned agency, so known for having this entrepreneurial spirit and these young, dynamic creatures working <laughs> for them. Um, and so I absolutely bit their hand off. And it was great because I got to work there three days a week whilst also building my own business, the helpful space in the background, so that I could coach other people just outside of, of that environment. So, so yeah, so I, I did that for two and a half years. And then more, more recently, I've decided to kind of take that on uh, through my own consultancy, the helpful space, I almost have a blueprint of how coaching has supported those people. And now I'm taking that out to other creative businesses to show them how it can support them too. I love that when you when you move from a career that has been uh, quite broad, I mean, within a particular sector, but what you've got to do was like a real learning curve. And then you're able to focus specifically on your strengths and on actually where your passion really lies and for you, you're so good at those relationships and at supporting people, having empathy, tuning in to where people are at emotionally. So being yeah. able to do that and and create your current role and your your company around that is such a great opportunity. I love when you, those moments come about where you can say, I'm going to seize the moment and do something different. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think I had it in my mind that it, I would maybe move out of the industry to mm. do this. It didn't really compute at that point that I could actually do it within the industry that I had such a fondness for. Um, so, so it was really nice to kind of marry the two, really. It wasn't something I'd necessarily thought about. But when it just happened out of the blue like that, it was just brilliant. So how did you then become specifically interested in allyship? So this kind of all stems from my upbringing, uh, you know, as well as working for stylist and just being kind of quite hyper aware of the women in my life and what they offer me and the things that I've learned from them, you know, 
I've learned kind of kindness, resilience, that empathy piece that you were talking about before from, from the women around me. And then I suppose what I've always tended to do is maybe mix in circles that aren't necessarily just men of my age. You know, I like to learn new things and put myself in different spaces. And there's a committee in Manchester called Bloom North. Um, and it's a committee of women supporting women in our industry. You know, it's about creating that equity across men and women and making sure that just women get those same opportunities, that they're paid fairly, that, um, you know, that we we start to understand a bit more about what's happening for women um, in terms of, you know, their bodies and, you know, crikey, women have been experiencing menstrual cycles and menopause since the dawn of time and yet we're only just starting to bring the, this awareness into business and how it's impacting people so I I um, go to these events run by Bloom for women and I can remember I was sitting in the audience brilliantly run events you know um, with such great speakers and I'm sitting in the crowd there's probably three men and 150 women um, and I often think, oh, crikey, someone's going to single me out from the stage and say something like, what are you doing here type thing? But I learned so much. And and I was sitting there listening to some of these challenges that women were facing. And I was thinking, why are more men not here listening to this? Or, you know, surely I'm part of the solution or other men are part of the solution to some of these things. And also, I'm learning a hell of a lot about myself in the at the same time mm. so I sent a voice message you know I love a voice note mm. uh, I sent a voice note to the new president of Bloom and I said you know I think it's brilliant that you're doing what you're doing and I absolutely love these events and um, it just strikes me that you know it can only go so far without bringing men into the conversation um, have you ever thought about that? And she said, oh, it's funny you should say that. I was literally just thinking about my presidency, that this is one of the things I want to do to make it a bit more collaborative. Um, how do you feel about being the head of allyship for the committee and being the first male role that we've ever had? We don't even have it in London. But it's nothing like going in at the top. <laughs> I oh, know, exactly, exactly. I, I had no idea that that's what would happen. But again, it's from it's from putting yourself out there in these new situations, you know, that, that would never have happened ordinarily. So um, we had a conversation and, you know, I, I shared some of my ideas and, and, you know, some of my background and they said, yeah, we'd love you to do it. And that was about eight or so months ago now. And we, it's been a really interesting journey, but quite difficult for me to balance as, as well alongside my own business because it's a volu voluntary role mm -hmm. and so I have to make it work alongside my other commitments and so that's just been a difficult balance to strike at times but such rewarding work I've absolutely loved it. And I think it is it's really interesting because it, it's almost it reminds me of what you and I were talking about just before you or before you hit record which is around that sense of um, being out of your comfort zone, out of your kind of normal crowd of people or your normal tribe. And you're mm -hmm. someone who's actually really comfortable around women um, and you just um, get on very well with them. You have very good relationships with them. I wonder if what it'd be like for um, a lot of other men going into that situation, whether they would, whether they'd be a, feel like a bit of a void in terms of how they, just in terms of like emotional intelligence, in terms of how people communicate with each other, what they feel and what they're able to communicate and that level of awareness and so on, or just in terms of being able to have, yeah, have empathy and put themselves in other people's shoes. And so it's something that you found quite a natural um, connection with and you're able to join that group and feel quite at home. Do you mm. think other, or do you know if other men joining that kind of environment have found the same um sort of found it quite as easy or or not because there's differences I think a, a selection of men uh find have the same experience as me but yeah I think a lot maybe 
it's a difficult one you know there's there's I've run some workshops with men to understand how they feel about this kind of stuff and and there's there's lots of different experiences happening that you know I think there's an exhaustion with 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 men in some respect and there's you know there's a feeling of I've got enough I don't need this on top there's there's a bit of that going on there's also a bit of guilt there as well because a lot of the structures that have been causing a lot of these problems have been run by men, have been created by men, you know. So there's there's guilt there, and that's something that you learn when you, when I took up this role, you know, granted there were some things that came kind of naturally, but there's a hell of a lot of learning as well, and I'm still on the process of that. That's a really important thing for people who are listening to know. I'm not professing to be an expert in this at all. What I'm doing is putting myself in the position to show that we can all do it. Mm. We can all lean into it. We can all try our best and we will make mistakes along the way and we'll get things wrong and we might not know it all. But that's that's almost the point. I think that, though, is so powerful and that, you know, what you've just described for me are almost the, the traits of good leadership in terms of and you being a good role model to others. It's not I'm the expert and this is how you should be doing it. It's like I just want to lean into this. I'm kind of exploring as I go along, getting feedback, talking to people, learning and therefore let's do that together. And it takes the pressure off, you know, people because I know for a lot of people who I speak to, they worry about saying the wrong thing if they would go into a room full of women they'd be like well how am I going to be received or what should I be saying or you know what is the right or wrong thing to do and I know that from when I've run workshops with like all male teams and they get a female member of the um, team join them they're like we don't know how to communicate with her <laughs> to the point where we end up having workshops around it so if you can do it and say actually let's we're learning together there's no right or wrong as long as your intentions are good and you want you're here for the right reason actually if you if you make a blunder, then you just say, oh, sorry, I didn't think about the fact that that might be offensive or how do I talk about this and it feel OK? Or is that that learning journey is so, so powerful? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's and and I still get that that feeling of tightness. And, you know, I have to host this event in a few weeks time and I'm terrified about just kind of introducing it even and not introducing it in the right way or, or getting the tone ever so slightly wrong where people think, oh, that was a bit clumsy. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. we all feel it, but I think men need that that sense of togetherness. What was very interesting from a, from a workshop that we ran was it was really palpable the sense of togetherness in the room when we actually got into the topics and when we were talking about privilege and dissecting privilege and you know because that's something else that's just mind-blowing really you think you know I'm a I'm a white uh white man for, for a start off that gives me privilege um but you don't necessarily think about all the different areas of privilege and the fact that there's 14 different categories. And when you look down the list, I'm kind of like, oh, 13 out of the 14, I have dominant privilege. So now I can see because I can see all these other people around me that clearly don't have those things. Therefore, I'm in a position where I need to be using this to support others who don't have what I have. Um, and when we were in that room talking alongside other men about all of this, they were contributing. They were really, you know, talking about things from a very personal angle and talking about, well, you know, I want this for my daughter who's currently six. And, you know, I don't want her to, to be experiencing the same things that we're talking about now. And But then I think where it sort of falls down at the moment is that as they exit the room it's almost forgotten about mm -hmm. and there's no kind of consistent communication with it or no consistent feeling that we need to keep talking about it it's kind of like well we've done our session now I'm going to go off and do what I need to do with my work 
Mm. So I think that's a bit of a challenge with it. It's how do we maintain the energy and the momentum? And it's like we need our own feminist movement. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we create that please <laughs> all right we'll meet after this <laughs> yeah. but it is it's, it's such an important point though because I think it's like whatever we're talking about so we could be talking about allyship we could be talking about mental health we can be talking about the psychological safety whatever if you have a meeting about something and you have a good discussion and that's great but actually what happens outside of that and that's the bit that I think often organizations forget they don't build it into their processes that happen day in day out and how do they keep that conversation live and how are they recognizing and celebrating anything that happens that is keeping that alive so it's I think it's a real issue and again I think partly that comes down to the fact that people are so busy it's like Mm. well I've I've attended that meeting had that conversation that's great I feel a bit more enlightened now about my level of privilege I'm now going to sort of whiz off back to my normal day job and it's so how do and that's got to be where it's much more strategic rather than individuals focusing on it yeah definitely we need frameworks we need there's something called the lean in matrix that was created by a a consultancy called token man token man consultancy run by a guy called danielle fiandaka who is an amazing ally and just very visible in this space and it's a brilliant visual because it just shows you the three sort of stages of what men can be doing. Mm. So stage one is leaning into these important issues and it shows you for each of the issues, how you can just be showing a bit of awareness for it, how you can be doing that base level, you know, showing that base level involvement Step two is becoming an ally and it's just going that little step further. Mm. And step three is becoming an agent of change. And that might be like you're talking about where you're actually building it into how you lead or, you know, building processes that then get um, seeded out across wherever. Mm. So, and, and that I thought was really, really helpful because you can see for each of the different areas that you that you might want to be looking at exactly where you sit on this framework and you can go okay so in order to get here I need to do x mm. and I think that's a really really good starting point I think the other thing is just unfortunately men sometimes need to know what's in it for them in order to in order to participate that's going to be my next question oh, right <laughs> so yeah what's in it for men <laughs> yeah and and I think what's in it for men is future proofing them as leaders themselves you know it's about just adding more strings to your bow as a leader and thinking about, you know, this is a a moment in time where we're all realizing that the previous way of doing things hasn't served us particularly well as a collab, you know, as a collaborative group. And so let's be part of creating that solution for everybody. Surely that, surely that has, you know, that's the energy that we're talking about, that motivation to create something that we can all look at and go, actually, that feels so much better. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's going back to what we were saying before about that empathetic leadership piece. I don't know if you're aware of Katie Leeson, who was my old MD at Social Chain, but she is just a fantastic figurehead for empathetic leadership. She, to share a bit of her story briefly, she was brought into social chain as the ops director. And within just a couple of months, the owners, Stephen Bartlett and uh, Don McGregor said, we want you as the MD. And they put her into that role. And she had never considered running a business at that point. And the way that she talks about it, classic case of imposter syndrome, feeling very, very vulnerable. And she decided to just embrace that vulnerability and just be open about it. And she created a podcast called I Shouldn't Say This But, where she, as an MD, was talking about all the things that she shouldn't talk about, (laughs) her fears and insecurities. And it was just so, so refreshing. And that's what I love about 
the fact that you know we're bringing more women into leadership we, we're you know I'm learning from the women around me like Katie mm. how you can be vulnerable and actually sh- show it as a strength because mm. I think if men if men could realize that as well I think it would be a game changer in actual fact because men hate feeling vulnerable they really shy away from it imagine if you could find strength in that vulnerability what that would do for you Mm. Uh, that would just be so powerful don't you it'd be incredible because one you know that's a characteristic that I know um jars with a lot of women are when men aren't don't show any vulnerability and they want to appear to be uh strong and in control and um you know know what they're doing and very competent and and so on and actually it's it's that in itself is quite um unnerving for a lot of women who then again it's talking about that was just mentioning about having that confidence yourself to have a go at stuff if you're if you feel like you're up against someone who has got it all ticked off and knows exactly what they're doing it doesn't add to confidence for women around to have a go and actually for the when they hear male leaders or men in work say actually I'm not sure about this or I want to give this a go might not work or I've actually made a mistake or this didn't go according according to plan is that sense of relief that we're actually all humans and we all experience the same not we don't necessarily feel it we don't experience in the same way but we still experience that how do we do this is it going to be right being able to kind of evaluate and so on and it's and we we approach it different ways in terms of level of confidence. You know, it's that classic when people go for jobs and you know that the research that shows that men will sort of tick a few of the boxes and they'll go, yeah, I'm competent enough to go for it. And women want to tick every single box before they mm-hmm. want to go for it. There's a lot to learn from each other, actually. Absolutely. About yeah, and it and it's that sense of um neither is right or wrong. We're we're all just all different. But as soon as we can start being a bit more authentic and a bit more vulnerable and saying, this is how I do it. It works for me or it maybe doesn't work for me or maybe there's a better way and I don't know about it yet. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. And and also, you know, learning from one another, yes, because I think we we all, um, you know, we probably have natural strengths on either yeah. side. But, you know, myself, for example, I'm not really a lot of male strengths that you might identify maybe I don't have as many of those so we're all on a spectrum aren't we and I think that's the main thing it's that yes it's collaboration of the sexes and collaboration of everybody but it's also not stereotyping and saying you know you can offer this and you can offer this it's it's kind of we're all in the melting pot together and we can all learn new things we can all learn from one another and none of us should have a ceiling that is repressing us from doing thing, other things that we might want to try. I think that's really important. I think that's a really good point about stereotyping. So I'd be curious to know if you've watched the film Barbie. I have. Okay, so <laughs> um, I think that's a really interesting one because um, there were, I went to see it with some of my friends and our uh, slightly older kids and it was really interesting. There was a lot of it we were kind of laughing along to and really resonated with us. But then we were looking at the end of that thinking, actually, um, what's the messaging for our young people? So for my 12-year-old daughter who went with me, it's like, actually, what's she come out with picking up from that movie? And mm. is it about stereotypes or is it about that actually women have a hard time in the world? And there was a bit of a backlash from guys saying, yeah, but hang on a minute. There's been so much in favour of now of women that actually, if you are a white middle-class male in work, actually you, the odds are stacked against you in favour of these other groups, whether you're, you know, whatever it's about, whether you're a um, gender or whatever. Mm. And there's a real kind of, it kind of sparked this conversation about actually, is it about putting people in particular boxes and promoting particular people? Is it about everyone just accepting that we've got to move away from this idea of stereotypes and recognise that, there are continuums, there are blurred edges around everything. Actually, we've got to stop putting people into boxes and just acknowledge that if we all treat each other with respect and all the qualities that we know are important, then mm. we support everyone in regardless of who they are, or what they're like. 
So, but then mm-hmm. that's almost counter to the idea of allyship. So I was curious to know about what your thoughts were on that. Oh gosh, there's a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd just drop that winner now. Yeah, drop it in for me, yeah. <laughs> um, gosh, I think um, what I picked up on there when you were speaking is you're absolutely right. Like we move in one direction and then we suddenly start charging in the opposite direction to support women. Mm-hmm. And there is a danger there, isn't there, of maybe it, it almost reminds me of like a spinning thing, what do you call mm-hmm. them, where they yeah, spun yeah, one way and then they start careering yeah. back the other way. Yeah. And you don't want to do that because then that will happen and men will get forgotten. And we know, don't we, that men have a bloody hard time too the suicide rate it's terrifying that seven young men from my year at school have committed suicide that I know about wow yes yeah one just quite recently which was really really sad and sometimes I question my emphasis Mm. And whether I'm putting my emphasis in the right place. You know, sometimes I think, hang on, Seb, you're a guy doing things differently. Why aren't you supporting men? And that's why at the moment I'm very much thinking about my support for men through my coaching, actually. Mm. Uh, How I can support men better in that way. Because, you know, you're right, it's the allyship shouldn't detract from supporting everybody. Mm. The allyship is one piece of the puzzle that I'm making an active step to support women, but that doesn't negate from the fact that I'm also there supporting other people as well. Mm. Um, so I think that's that's kind of really important because men are becoming more important as well in my mind there's a lot to unpick there and I think it might be a separate podcast. <laughs> I, I agree but I think I think you know you've explained that really well in terms of actually you're not f- solely focused in one camp if you like it's you're aware of what you can bring to allyship of your influence in that area and the benefit you can bring um, to women in in business but you're also aware of the reality for men which is why you're also focusing on men with your coaching and I think that's a really balanced approach which is a, and it goes back to what we we're saying about it's having it's looking at the big picture you can't just focus on one bit of the puzzle um mm-hmm. or if you are focusing on one bit of the puzzle you've got to know that there is someone else looking at the other bit and you've got to also be talking to that person to make sure it is linked up so you don't end up alienating people and you don't end up with some groups who may well be the majority group saying, well, hang on, it's already well the focus being on those people, but what about us? And so actually when you can, and I guess it goes back to what you were saying about the benefits for everyone. So by focusing on one particular group of people, there are benefits to everyone. And that's the bit that we need to focus on. Definitely. Absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it It's not... Yeah, you're not elevating one set of people at the expense of others. You're finding solutions to problems that ultimately affect us both, don't they? I mean, at Cranky, especially if you're looking at things like caring responsibilities or those types of things, mm-hmm. you know, we can't solve one without solving the other. So there's lots of benefits there that that support men. Um, but I think it's just bringing a bit of a different mindset to these challenges and just you know what does it matter if you are solving problems for somebody else and not for yourself is that not a great thing to do yeah full (laughs) stop yes (laughs) but yeah absolutely yeah and that goes back to I mean so much of what I talk about which is you know people talk about you know your bottom line you talk about money and stuff he's like actually you do things because it's the right thing to do. You do think because we're human and actually it's about caring for other people and looking out for other people and supporting other people. It's, yeah. 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 I think that's what the pandemic's taught us as well, isn't it? Since 
since work and home lives have become kind of inextricably linked mm. you know you can't treat people as employees anymore you have to treat them as humans and you have to think about what this individual needs versus this individual and it's it's open pandora's box in a way but it's meaningful stuff isn't it it's it's life it's yeah exactly it's people and, it's people and life I mean you can't get much more important than that can you no, no so I so I um had a conversation with Sean Akers a while ago on my podcast talking about it's a two-parter actually she had a lot to say um about superpowers of women and she um also has written about superpowers of men and she's was a, is a real fan of um, allyship and talked in that episode a bit about how she could engage or how companies could actually engage men in thinking about um, allyship a little bit more and becoming allies of women and and just rethinking their practice. Have you got any thoughts about how you or how companies can encourage men to engage with this agenda? Um. I think there's the point that we made before about just encouraging encouraging men or all of us just putting ourselves in different spaces and, you know, different environments where we're going to mix with other perspectives and people. Like, don't stay in your lane, you know. There's, there's agencies that I've worked for that have sort of boys clubs and you know they're kind of you sometimes feel like people just need to break out of their normal setting and listen like you were saying to other perspectives and listen to challenges Mm -hmm. um and I think you know the Bloom North Committee is just such a brilliant creation for reflecting back what our industry is experiencing you know you can so I think more things like that more things whether it's within businesses committees to reflect back what's happening Mm. are great you know we had a culture committee in my old company which was just brilliant for bringing together lots of different perspectives from different um from different um areas of the company sorry Mm. um to to kind of come together and to talk about the bigger things that are impacting everybody um so I think we just need to do a little bit more of that it's it's kind of mixing in spaces with other teams other people finding ways to listen to challenges Mm. is is the main starting point I would say um but then you alluded to it before it's about taking action and even if it's only just a small action thinking what is it that I could do what is my one little thing that I could do to support you know if you're a male senior leader is there a female that you could sponsor or somebody that you could mentor could you even be mentored by a younger person Mm. you know that's reverse mentoring is is a really powerful thing to really understand how you know the bones of your business feel about certain things so I think that's another really good thing that people can be doing that's really powerful I'm glad you mentioned that Sarah because I think reverse mentoring is so good on so many levels um Mm. and it challenges so many there's misconceptions around the longer you've been here the more you know and the better you know how to do stuff it's like actually you need new blood you need new ideas and that new creativity and um and that's the power, I think, of having, you know, when you've got younger people coming in or minority groups and you're asking for their views, it's actually how do other people see this? We all have different perspectives, don't we? And I'm a real fan of getting people, whether you're um, doing some like reverse mentoring or team meetings is another really great place to have, you know, what you're talking about, having the conversations on committees, a really easy starting point because most people teams or every team should be having team meetings um is actually at that to have really good quality conversation about how do we think about how do we feel about whatever that particular thing is so I've mm. done team just dis- created team discussion frameworks around stress and depression and so on so actually we all know we're feeling stressed but actually what how do we relate to that what's causing us stress right now or how do I feel 
personally about this or what am I noticing other people or what could we do in our team that would make a real difference to how I'm feeling right now as soon as you that. start having really good quality authentic conversations which is not about having someone coming in being an expert in this area whatever the area is is literally having a set of really good questions which are essentially asking what's your experience of this and how does that feel and what's not so great and what works brilliantly and as soon as you have that conversation with the people in the room, immediately your eyes are opened up to actually, oh, I never realised that that's how it made you feel. Or we could do this. It's so simple to do something different. I love that. And I love younger people seeing senior people talk about their vulnerabilities in that. You know, mm. someone more senior saying, actually, I've really struggled with this over the last couple of weeks. But you know, what I've been doing is X and Y, mm -hmm. you know, there's that real need, especially in our industry in media and advertising, when you're working on behalf of clients, you've got to put that game face on for clients. And it almost because, because of the fast paced nature of the work, and you're always game face going into your meetings, doing your thing, it doesn't allow that space for the vulnerability to, to come in. Mm -hmm. But that's why I think we need to slow the pace down. And like you say, start bringing in more of these meaningful conversations that can really help arm people with the solutions to some of the problems, mm -hmm. um, which would be great. So what would be your advice if you were to say to people who are listening to this, right, I want you to go away and do these two or three things that's going to make a real difference to allyship in your organisation. What would be your advice? Oh, crikey. Um, I would say, firstly, very simply, open your ears. Don't, don't, don't go in with a solution. Go in with, you know, an, a genuine question that gives somebody else the opportunity to speak and just try and take a moment to learn somebody else's perspective for a second. Mm. The other thing that I would say to anybody who's listening who thinks that this is an important topic and anything around D and I as well is to to go and research the amazing companies who are offering training around these things because it really does open your eyes to to what's actually happening you know like I said before you can talk about privilege very on a very surface level and when you go under the umbrella and really start to understand it so look up the other box and companies like that who offer this training to businesses because it will absolutely revamp how your team feeling about these things I would say um and then I suppose the third one is just about continuing the conversation, just trying to create that consistency with whatever it is that you're doing personally, you know, just trying to always have something in the background that you're checking in with to make sure that, you know, you're putting your best foot foot forward in your industry and doing the best that you possibly can to support the people around you I think you know finding ways to keep the momentum is mm. such an important one and I don't have all the answers like I've said but you know there's there's um some really great resources on the token man consulting site that I mentioned before that are downloadable for businesses and they include you know, reference points from studies that have been done from male leaders who have adopted this thinking around being trying to be better allies and trying to be more inclusive and what they've learned as part of that experience. So I would really encourage people to do that as well and to just just boost your knowledge in the background. You don't have to put yourself in a vulnerable position alongside people having big, heavy conversations. You can just go and do a bit of work by yourself to begin with to educate yourself. I like that advice there because I think sometimes people think if I'm going, if I want to get involved with this, that means I've got to sort of put my hand up and volunteer to be on a committee and be a kind of leading voice. And actually everyone has their part to play, however small. And yeah. it might just be listening to a podcast or reading something and just thinking, how do I engage with that? What am I doing that's helping this cause or actually blocking this cause? And, you know, it could be something as subtle as, 
if people are posting on LinkedIn, what are they posting about? They're just posting what they want to post about. Are they celebrating what other people are doing? It's the little things yeah. that individuals can all do. But if every individual in an organization started doing that collectively, that's like, wow. Definitely. Definitely. I love that about, and you never see that on LinkedIn, do you? But people mm-hmm. celebrating others, particularly within their industry. You know, I'd like to see a bit more of that. That'd be good. So, said before we finish, is there anything else that you would like to talk about that you think um, or to pr- sort of promote in terms of this whole agenda around allyship or privilege or? Yeah, I think um, first off, um, I would love people to engage with my uh, presence on uh, Instagram and LinkedIn. The helpful space is on there as a business, and I'm on there as Seb Brundle and. You know, I talk about allyship a lot. I talk a lot about the work that we're doing. So that would be great for people to do. Um, I've referenced a couple of um, people like The Other Box and Token Man Consulting that I think people should go and investigate. Um, And for anybody who's interested in sort of coaching around these topics and sort of learning more about it, you know, I'm always here just as a sounding board for people, not necessarily if people want the coaching necessarily but maybe it sparked an interest in them and they want to know how to approach it for themselves and you know I like to make myself available to people in whatever way they want to utilize me really that sounds a bit wrong but you know what I mean I know exactly what you mean <laughs> and, uh, and I love that and I can actually vouch for the fact that you are someone who's just really <laughs> easy just to pick up the phone to and say what do you reckon or what do you think about or had this idea so um I would strongly recommend people get in touch with you. And we're going to put all the links, Seb, to contact you and to the resources you've mentioned. And Blue um, North as well, of course. Blue North, where I am the head of allyship, of course. So <laughs> I forgot them. Can we include them too? <laughs> yeah, of course we can. Um, <laughs> so before I let you go, I have a blind question to ask you from oh. another guest um, recently, uh, Kathy Heath uh, from the Healthy Minds Club. Her question, Seb, is what's the most shocking thing that nobody knows about you? Oh, wow. (laughs) Shocking thing. That's quite a hard question. I should have had a bit of music here, like, just to fill this little gap. (laughs) Um, Gosh. So... I don't know if it's shocking or I'm going to be vulnerable. Seeing as I'm asking men to be vulnerable, I'm going to be vulnerable. So for 20 years, I experienced really quite severe um, body dysmorphia um, due to, you know, going through adolescence and, you know, young people's bodies changes in, change in ways that you can't always control. And, you know, very difficult because, um, you know, when you're a young lad playing sport at school, if there's not enough shirts for the team, you play with no tops on and you go bouncing balls and running around rugby pitches when you're not feeling particularly great about your body. And let me tell you, it's not a nice feeling. Mm. So uh, after 20 years of struggle, I finally built up the courage to go to the doctors and ended up on the operating table within seven weeks uh, and had an operation that made me feel a hell of a lot better. I'm never going to be the most confident man when it comes to my body, Mm. but it was a really important step for me that not that many people know about. So (laughs) I've really uh, opened myself up there and shared. Um, And I suppose, you know, what's great these days is seeing so many people out in the world championing any kind of body shape, uh, which I think is great and absolute power to them. Um, But for me, that was something that was really important for me to do. And I'm proud of myself for doing it. And I have to say thank you so much Seth, for sharing that because that's like a wow answer to that um, very tricky <laughs> question and your vulnerability. I mean, you really are practicing what you're encouraging people to do um, in terms of speaking up and being vulnerable. And I think it's great that people are championing, championing everything, you know, everything is okay now. But actually, you've also made a really good point about if you're really not feeling okay about something, you do need to speak up. And your example of going and speaking to a doctor and with very quickly something happened that made you feel better about things. It's like 
it's such a strong message isn't it it's like you don't have overthinking to be streamlined into seven weeks before an operation it was you know it it, that was a real eye-opener for me in terms of being open and and saying how I feel you know because there's always someone there to help if you give them the chance and it really relates to what you were saying earlier about suicide and that ability you know it's that it's having the courage to speak up and to say I'm not happy this is what's going on for me right now and someone will help in some capacity um thank you for sharing that Seb you have been awesome today I knew I was gonna really enjoy this because it's just so (laughs) it's always so lovely chatting to you it's actually been a while since I don't know if we've ever done this on a zoom before because we're usually on phones walking around fields having a good old catch up um so thank you for your time I know you're super busy um I have really enjoyed hearing about your approach to allyship and and actually making it a topic that everyone can engage with at whatever level and just kind of normalizing some of this stuff um whether we're talking I mean sorry for throwing things in like the Barbie question and stuff which you just you're really good at making people think and I'm like ah oh. but I think all that stuff it's 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 there's lots there's lots going on in our society now that are just opportunities to have the conversation and to reflect and the more we do that the more we support things like allyship so um so thank you very much for helping promote that with our listeners today pleasure pleasure lovely to see you see you soon thanks i hope you enjoyed the conversation today i invite you to think about one thing that you will take away to think about or do differently i'd be really grateful if you can give me a thumbs up on apple or wherever you listen to your podcasts and for an extra brand point leave me a short review I'm really keen to help drive real change for better practice in the world of people at work and spreading the message will help that. I'd love you to also join the club to stay in the loop and be the first to hear about exciting things that I'm developing, including free downloadable resources. Please do reach out to me directly to discuss the topics covered on this podcast or perhaps other challenges around people at work. And if we're not already acquainted on LinkedIn, please connect. All the links you need are in the show notes. Until next time, bye for now.